Messias la da lunga su Leao, Leao, Leao contro Kuminers, Leao, 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 Goal! Ha segnato Leao! Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Sempre Milan podcast. I'm your host, Ollie Fisher, joined once again by Anthony Tolgrud. What's up guys? Glad to be back. It's August 1st. I got a pumpkin spice. Um, flame me all you want, but I can't be stopped. <laughs> the perfect opening remark. That is so on brand for you. Um, yeah, happy August, everyone. You know what that means? It's the month where the Serie A season starts. Um, the team is still in the USA, but you know that that first game is getting closer and closer when we get to talk about some real meaningful action. Um, but we have still got a game to talk about in this, the UV game that took place out in Carson, California. Um, we'll talk a little about, bit about the Barcelona game that's to come as well, our final one of the USA Tour. And then we've got a lot of questions to go through as well. So um should still be an action-packed episode. Um, before we dive into it, we have to say thank you, as always, to those who uh, subscribe to us on Substack and those who are our founding men- members, Ali Tarin, Tito, Mac, Moritz, Pullman, Joey Gawler and Kemin. Um, thank you so much to, to everybody who continues to support what we're doing bonus content-wise over there. The bonus podcast this week will be on Samuel Chukwese, uh, who became the seventh summer signing last week. So that should be an exciting one because I think for a lot of people, he's the highest profile and the most important addition that we've made this summer. Um, so yeah, be sure to check that out. There's going to be some some more bonus articles on the budget and how much we've spent this summer, how it will affect our accounts. Isaac's doing a great job with all that stuff, so thank you if you've subscribed already. And if you haven't, go check it out. You can do seven days for free. So if you like what you see, then um, then then you can commit from there. So uh, let's go, man. Let's let's get into it. Preseason, we're in full flow. Uh, yeah. We finally put out a, what I would consider a. Um, it's close enough to a to a first choice eleven for this this middle friendly of the three that we're playing in America against UV at the what was it called Sports Health Dignity Park or something yeah like that. Health Dignity Sport Park or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 um and it was against UV so I suppose there's a little bit of an added something given that it's against a domestic rival but it did feel very much like a preseason game did this to be honest um, having Lost 3-2 against Real Madrid in the first game. Juve had their first game against Barcelona cancelled because the Barca squad had like a big outbreak of flu or, or some virus thing. Um, so we were coming into this with sort of 90 minutes more in our legs uh, on this American tour so far. The game ended 2-2. It was four set pieces that produced the goals, like live and die by the sword, you know. Uh, we might yeah, be scoring yeah. him again now, but we're going to still be letting him in as well. Right, yeah. We'll, we'll never uh, tighten up our set-piece defense, but at least we're we're making the most of it offensively. Um, yeah, it was an interesting game. You know, we, we came out with, like you said, what will most likely be the majority of our starting 11 for the season. And it was just kind of an okay game. You know, there wasn't a whole lot going on. I definitely think... Juve looked the better side, but we ultimately opened the scoring first. Um, and forgive me, I'm already forgetting who scored it. Was it, was it Chow? It was Malik Chow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Header Chow from scored free it. Kick, took it short, Taylor whipped it in, and it was a nice looping header yeah. past Chesney at the far post. Yeah, and then they equalized like shortly thereafter. Um, also, no, bad. this was from a corner, wasn't it? Yeah, this was a corner, and they had a... It was flicked on at the near post by McKenney. Then I think Gatti had a couple of stabs at it. Uh, oh, yeah, lost it was the that. a third attempt. Danilo, Danilo it, it got it saved in. twice, yeah. yeah. And then the third, yeah. so it was scrappy, really scrappy. Um, one of those goals that it's just like, whatever, what are you going to do about it? You know, if, if you save the first two shots and it still is bouncing back to him, like, at some point, you just got to give it, you know, it is what it is. But mm-hmm. so then that happened. And then uh, Giroud scored, I believe, um, another set piece goal right after pretty. And then at the resumption after halftime, uh, they had a free kick that uh, Giroud also scored. But yeah. It was an own goal. Um, I, I think they ended up crediting it to to one of the Juve players. Rugani, but, yeah. 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 But it definitely came off of Giroud's head and not Rugani's on the replay. So. Mm-hmm. Um, that was kind of a bummer. And then around 65 minutes or so, everyone was subbed off and it was youth kids plus CDK and, uh, it showed, you know, it mm. was just kind of 
mind-numbingly boring. Uh, for me on the East Coast, it was 10.30 p.m. kickoff time. So as you can imagine at this point, it was close to midnight, and I was just like, okay, you know, let me just go to bed. I don't want to watch this know. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, Madison, he he did. He fucked off and went to bed, and I was like, well, that's why you're not on this week because he didn't watch it. <laughs> um, He'd probably and, still be able to give as much insight on that last 25 minutes given how the game yeah. was played. There were a couple of chances here and there, to be fair. Uh, but it did look like kids v kids just sort of jogging about, trying just hoping for one moment of inspiration. Uh, and then we got a penalty shootout to decide what exactly. I don't know. I mean, I didn't even mention it in the headline yeah. for the match report, like it was irrelevant. Um, but I mean, you know, Luca so Romero was nailed like on a... the score. Oh, God, were, were they doing like a round robin table thing for this preseason tour? With uh, like, I, I don't know. I genuinely, I'm confused no on it. I, but... I think they. I think they just wanted to make a show of it, a spectacle of it, to have a winner in each game, you know, rather than have it end as a draw. But yeah. I don't, I don't think it counts towards anything because we're flying home. It's not as if the team with the most points from their three games plays in a final or anything. Right, right. Uh, it's literally just, yeah, that's it. Yeah, but. very strange. Um, I definitely, as as people may have seen from all these wonderful screenshots on Twitter, um, I fully expected Luca Romero to score his. Uh, I was hyping him up in the chat. No one was replying. I was talking to myself. So you see Luke Romero uh, for sure buries this. Then my next message was Luke Romero taking it first. I love this kid. He's got balls of steel, something like that. And then the next one was, oh, my, that's the worst pen I've ever seen. Fully and it was. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was and real bad. a little close-up after he took the pen because, obviously, he fully stacked it. His mm -hmm. standing leg went from under him and – you can't take a penalty accurately after that, so he loops it up over the bar. But like they showed a, a zoom in, at least on my feed, of, of the area around the penalty spot, and the pitch is cut up so badly that I almost don't blame him. And like every player then went and took it with an eye on that, and I think yeah. it affected the quality of the penalties from there on because um, we had another saved. It was uh, was it Pabega? I think had one saved. Then they missed one with Ealing Junior and. Whoever the guy was who stepped up, who could have won it, um, might have been Sula or did he score? No, it was uh, it? Kostic. That's the one, yeah, Kostic, yeah. Um, and, and you could tell that they weren't really in a position to aim it anymore. They just wanted to get it on target because yeah. of how bad the penalty spot was. Um, but yeah, Sportiello made a couple of decent saves in that, I guess. That's, that's something. Um, then it went to sudden death and yeah, just didn't happen, did it? But... Um, don't care. <laughs> so just don't care about the penalty shootout. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, like, the game, the game, that's what matters. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll talk about the positives first. No, I won't. I'll sandwich positive with two negatives. The negatives, set piece defending. First goal, yeah, there's a bit of a look, bit of a look to it from Juve's point of view because, as you kind of mentioned, the ball uh, bobbled around inside the box a couple of times when it just landed straight back to them. You can't really legislate for that. However, when you are presented with the opportunity to get the ball the fuck away from the danger zone, you know, twice, you should probably do it. Uh, and I thought we were a bit... Some of the things we accused the team of being last season when it came to set-piece defending, they often lost their man. You know, the mm -hmm. bit of a mix-up between zone and man marking. Um, so somebody lost lost their man and it was often the most dangerous man as well. And then just being flat-footed when it comes to reacting to second balls. It's pre-season, so I can't absolutely hammer them for it. It's not like that was the first game of the season, first competitive game, whatever. But sloppy errors like that after the, we made a couple in the Real Madrid game that were individual, you know, to keep making them is a little bit annoying because we should be ironing these things out and we should be a bit more match sharp than you here because they hadn't had that first friendly. That was disappointing. And then the, the second goal that they scored, Rugani, yeah, it, it was a header that then glanced off Giroud and went in and, and it went kind of through Maignan, which was a little bit disappointing too. But God, like Rugani had the freedom of California to head that ball. Um, he's kind of unlucky that he glanced it straight at Giroud, but, you know, he was totally left alone. So I don't know what the hell had happened there, but there'd clearly been a mix-up. That was kind of disappointing to see as well. Uh what what can you say, man? Set pieces. Yeah, um, I mean, my my biggest takeaway is, you know, when there is a penalty shootout at the end of a, a game that doesn't go to extra time, it doesn't count. So to me, that's just a two two yeah. draw, which means we're now six consecutive games unbeaten against Juventus, and um, that's really all there is to say. 
<laughs> like it's, yeah. it was a it was a preseason game. You know, you saw a lot of players that aren't going to play, and you saw rusty players who are going to play. And it is what it is. Two two is not a bad result for for people who aren't match fit right now. You know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I honestly don't like with with these preseason games. The, it's weird the way it's worked out because obviously we have the game against the Mitsane Series C side. You can't take too much from battering players who have only just come out of being part time. Um, then you've got these three quite high profile friendlies in America, but each team we play are at different stages of their of their preparation. We'll come on to the Barca game, but the lineup that they're expected to field is like crazy, um, and I think that that shows the different stages we're at. But then, sort well, of the friendly news. Um, Eunice Moose's medical is on Thursday. He arrives tomorrow in Milan. Excellent. So that's the bonus for next week. Sorted. Um, <laughs> that that's ended up being done. You know, it did, yeah. That that deserves a separate discussion, to be yeah. honest. But I'm 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 okay with that. Uh, where was I? Oh yeah, and then we've got friendlies against like three or four random teams, including Monza in the in the Berlusconi Trophy in the lead up to that first match against Bologna. So it's like the opponents get easier again before that first game of the season, uh, which is a strange way to to construct the preseason. But I suppose to an extent, it's kind of always been like that. Uh, yeah. we've, often, we've often had a weird friendly before the season starts. Like I think it was Panathinaikos before the Scudetto season. Uh, so. I think it's just another chance to get get you know um, mileage under your legs or whatever the expression is. Training sessions, aren't they? Yeah, that's all it is. Just keep them sharp. You don't want to risk any injuries. I mean, we've we've had what five minor, two serious injuries in the, the two preseason games that we've played in the U.S. already. So it's like if we're gonna do these preseason games and you have to, like, why risk anything? You know, like obviously mm-hmm. you want a few high level ones to where you could really see where you're at and what needs tweaking, but. At the end of the day, you just you just want to get fitness in the the boys, and also Samuel Chukwueze is not even with the squad right now. The guy mm. who most people think is the biggest name signing of the summer, he's not even there. So, like, how much can we even take away from this right now? You know, without the best players in air quotes, because you know it's still Leo. But yeah, it's it's a near meaningless friendly, and that's okay. Yeah. Um... Uh, this one I found tougher to. I, tr- I tried to do sort of three takeaways from rather than five things, three takeaways from each friendly. The Lumatsani game was a bit easier because obviously we scored seven goals and there were some really positive performances in there. The Real Madrid game felt a lot more action packed to me, and there's the, there's the uh, novelty factor of, of playing Real Madrid and mm. then bringing on some of their big guns and whatnot. I struggled a bit more for this one, to be honest, to, to find key and concrete things that we could say, right, we, we saw that. Uh, but one of them that I did pick out was was just the midfield because Ryan has got his first start since arriving. Mm. Obviously, he'd been doing training sessions, getting to grips with everything, what, what Pioli wants from him. And he ended up starting um, as the left-sided Metzala box-to-box player with Loftus-Cheek as the right-sided player and then Krunic at the base of the midfield. I thought it was fairly obvious that we lined up in a 4-3-3. Some people had kicked off about that idea in the Real Madrid friendly, saying, no, it was definitely a 4-2-3-1 again. But Ryan, as I thought, looked pretty sharp. You know, yeah. he wanted to get on the ball, and when he started driving forward, he beat his man quite easily. And I think Juve's midfield were, were kind of shocked at the ability. It was, it was like an eel. He kept squirming away, you know? I think one of the um, strong points from Rinders that I saw were, were his through balls. Mm-hmm. And once we take... Giroud out of the equation and say it's Okafor who's starting, who is also with the squad but not not playing because he just arrived, you know. Um, he's going to be able to get to his man with those balls. You know, we kept him to go past Giroud because he's just simply not quick enough, whereas Okafor is a faster, more mobile guy. And we, we actually saw it with Maignan as well. He played a through ball from box to to the opposite box, really. The, the Juve keeper grabbed it. But, I mean, you've seen that from Reinders on multiple occasions where he's he's playing the right ball for who will be the forward at some point, just not in those games. And had it have been a guy like Okafor or or even someone else who may be coming in down the road, I, I think we're looking at two assists for him. You know, I, I think what he's doing is exactly what we've been missing in the midfield. You know, it's mm. it's almost 
I, I might get a little heat for this, but it's almost a, a perfect replacement for Ben Asser until he returns. I think. Yeah, no, I agree. He he's been playing exactly like him, almost even better because his frame's just bigger. You know, he's not getting um, beat around. Not not that Ben Asser really did, but you know, he he would go to ground to win a lot of balls, whereas I don't think Rander will have to 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 win the exact same balls if that makes sense. So. Um, I'm really happy with Tijani. I think everything we've seen from him right now has just been exactly what we've been promised. And yeah, I think he's going to be a revelation in the midfield this season. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was really, really encouraged by the early signs from him, given it was his first game and he's still learning something all the time about his teammates. You've also got to factor in that Krunic behind him or across from him is playing in a role that is not natural to him. And Loftus Cheek's in a similar position to him. Yeah, he's had a bit more time to adapt but ultimately he's a new signing, still trying to learn about the players around him. That's one thing that we're all looking at, is how is this whole thing going to gel? And I do think that that things were promising from the starting eleven in that sense. And Loftus-Cheek's been pushing up quite a lot as well. There were times where it looked a bit like a 4-1-1-4, like he was playing literally on a level with the front three. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's going to be an important weapon this season as well. We've seen it before when Pioli has sort of promoted one of the midfielders forward to that number 10 spot and really it was just to add a bit of physicality to the forward line but also drag the defence about and create space for the more creative players behind so more of that would be good you know um the other takeaway that I took from it and this might be a tad reactionary um given it literally was a reaction piece but having had time to dwell on it I I don't think it's too I don't think it's too outlandish and the rumours that we've heard since have kind of backed it up. I I don't think that our defence is anywhere near fixed or anywhere near perfect, to be honest. Uh, Prior to the game, I feel like all the links were about getting a backup left back in and then we'll see about if we can get a right back in like Singo through through some other kind of thing. I think centre-back is so clearly our biggest need at this Mm -hmm. point. You know, Kier missed this game because of workload management. You know, to be at that position in pre-season is kind of crazy. Yeah, uh, it's it's not good. It doesn't encourage me. I don't think we're going to get many games out of Kier next season. I've, I don't I've think he's even in the plans. While. Yeah, I, I, I mean, like Milan News and, and other reputable sources have started to suggest that it's not excluded that he actually leaves now, or that you know he he could be considered fifth choice, an absolute mm-hmm. emergency uh, emergency player in that role. But then it's like Tamari. Uh, was inconsistent last season. There's no two ways about it. His highs were very high. You know, man of the match, second leg against Spurs was outstanding. His lows were very low and and mm-hmm. sometimes he, he cost goals. And Pierre Kalulu, you can say the same about he'd lost his starting spot by the end of the season to Malik Chow. Malik Chow's still very raw at, at 21. We can't expect him to be the finished product yet. He, he needs time to develop chemistry with Tamari. And... Um, Matteo Gabbia has left and Giancarlo Simic it feels a tough ask to promote him yeah. and say you know your fourth choice and we're going to have to play you sometimes alongside Kalulu say when we have to rotate so I think another another sign, signing of a centre back has all of a sudden become one mm-hmm. of the priorities and then obviously a backup left back is needed so that's two right. pieces that we need and then at right back Calabria has gone down injured it sounds like he's not going to be risked against Barcelona but that is, you know, another unfortunate injury for him uh, to add to the list. Florenzi's got a list of injuries, two knee surgeries and a, another surgery since he's been with us. So then you think about, well, are we going to shift Kalulu over to right back? That erodes our centre-back depth. So maybe we actually need a signing in each pos- position yeah. in defence. I, I think look. if you go back two seasons, the, the year we won the Scudetto, you look at our defence and how we were the best defence in the league. What has changed since then? Well, we had a very physical player in Frank Kessie protecting the line. We had mm-hmm. Tonali, who was real rough in your face type of physical player. And you had Benacer, who was great with ball distribution. You take out Kessie, and now all of a sudden we're we're still a good defense, but we're we're leaky. We had that run from January to March where we conceded like a thousand goals. Mm-hmm. Um, now you take Tonali out, and Benacer is out as well and you replace them with more attack-minding players in the midfield, the protection that the, the center backs are having or, or had is now gone. Now it's when they, someone gets past the midfield, they're right at the throats of our, our defense and our goalkeeper and our center backs because that midfield is so far forward doing the attacking business that it's really going to put 
a more physical strain on the center backs to to do their job and like at a higher higher standard or whatever terminology you want to use but also they don't have the room to make mistakes they don't have that extra guy to cover for them and i think we're going to see more goals come come in because of that which we are in in preseason you know we had a two goal lead against real madrid snapped in 10 15 minutes we we couldn't keep a lead against Juve. We took the lead twice, but still dropped it each time. You know, and we're seeing that our attack is now in a good spot to be in. You know, our attack is doing really well, and we've improved it over the summer. But the defense has has been ignored, and maybe it's not a regression of Tamori and Chow and Kalu and Calabria and everyone. I think more it's just an exposure of them. You know, we're, yeah. we're seeing their flaws in 4k because the the midfield isn't there to protect him anymore so we do need someone stronger there you look at a guy we missed out on last summer like um sven botman at newcastle how much would he have helped us instead of cdk probably massively since cdk's impact was near negative you know mm. if we get another not even top quality but just high level center back in that 15 to 20 mil range i think we're, we're talking a really safe spot because you're right we we did just lose gabia Kier is probably a foot out the door right now. It doesn't seem like he's going to be capable of even hanging in there. And and who else do we have? Kalu, who, who's been real shaky and is also still very young. And Chow is also super young. So there's a lot of question marks. And I do think that now that we have fixed the right wing spot and improved the striker position and given some depth for Liao and, and helped out the midfield, now you look at what else is left and it's, it's the center backs. Yeah, totally agree. And and as I say, the reports that have come out since the game seem to suggest that centre-back is now uh, something that's on our list. And I think if you in- improve the depth in that position as well, then you can maybe get away with Kalulu filling in at right-back every now and again, which we know that he can do. I think that offers more solutions than going for another out-and-out full-back. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of rumours pop up there. I know Maxime Steve from Montpellier has been has been linked again and, and no doubt other profiles will will come out, but we've got a month to fix it. You know, this is the first day of August, and some some of those classic opportunities could come up that we could look to seize. But um, but yeah, I, I I am worried about the midfield, and I'm worried about how exposed it's going to leave the the defense. The, there were big gaps between the three departments last season, which caused us to be ruthlessly exposed in transition time and time again, and that was the biggest problem in our two bad stretches in January and March and I don't think we've necessarily addressed the midfield anchoring position so we're just going to be going for aggressive pressing and and hoping that that does the job of covering for the defence I think quality teams are going to pick through that and you know I'm worried at the moment but Mm -hmm. there's still time left to fix it so fingers crossed the management have seen it and and are looking to address it Uh, that's it from the Real Madrid uh, from the Juve game to be totally honest I, I, I don't think there's there's too much more to talk on. No. Uh, uh, one thing I will say is the crowd was totally different to the Real Madrid game. There's like 70,000 versus, I don't know. Probably 18. 18, I, 18 I think 000. that stadium only holds 20 to 25. It's relatively small and it, it looked very empty. And I, I wonder why, to be mm. honest with you. You know, I, I feel like. Is Carson in the middle of nowhere? No, it's in LA. It's. Oh, right. right. Yeah, it's, it's where the Galaxy play. So it's. Um, the pretty trafficked uh, stadium as far as MLS goes. And, mm. you know, having Christian Pulisic and Weston McKenney playing against each other and, and Tim Weah, like you would think that it would have probably done well, but I guess not. I don't know. It's strange. Yeah, no, that is a strange one. Um, perhaps it does go to show as well the draw that Real Madrid and Barcelona will have in these games because of the demographic. I'm curious to see what the uh, turnout will be. Well, since I put the, put the Barca up, we'll switch that. But I'm curious to see what yeah. the turnout will be there because, like you said, Barca obviously is going to pull huge names. Um, this is in Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas where the Raiders play. It's one of the most amazing stadiums I've ever been to. It's beautiful. It's brand new. So oh, you've been? That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my parents went to Vegas a um, few years back, and we've been plenty. But, yeah, it's, it's an awesome stadium. It's huge. I don't know what the capacity is, but I would imagine 50 70, to 60. 70? I think. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. I'll, I'll check um, that, but yeah. Yeah, it's a big stadium, so I can't imagine it's a sellout, but, you know, it should have a good atmosphere. It's um, 61,000 for soccer mm. games is what it says. Okay. It's more for NFL. It can hold up to 71,800. But yeah, yeah, I mean, just looking at the pictures here, it's stunning. And it's funny yeah. that we are 
obviously it's been well documented for years we've been trying to build our own state of the art stadium and i think that there's obviously more to this usa trip than just uh, these these friendly games the, there's a, a whole corporate and and marketing exercise that comes with it mm-hmm. and infrastructure too because italian football's lagging behind and we've got american ownership what might they be able to to give us vision wise to help us catch up building a new stadium is one of the things that they're focusing on and what better thing to do than go and see a, a shining example of yeah. of what it can look like at a brand new stadium. Same with when we got Spurs in the Champions League, for example, and the club made a big deal about the revenues that, that it generates, but also how it can completely transform an area. And um, I think we're going to hear more and more about it. I don't know who built the Allegiant Stadium, but I want to say that it's the studio that are now uh, in the running for the San Donato Stadium, Manica. Manica Architecture, who oh, oh, Manica Sportium were the ones who did the two rings for the original, the one that was going to be built next to mm-hmm. San Siro, but then we picked the populous one instead. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they're consulted in the in the design process. But, yeah, Barcelona game then. I've got the likely 11s here. Comes from Gazetta. There's not been anything from Sky just yet. But for us, it's pretty I thought, much... Um, I thought... Wait, is Luca Baichan... Gazetta, I thought he was Sky. Gazetta, yeah. Oh shoot, no, my Gazetta. bad. Uh, so it's going to be Manian in goal for us. Calabria seemed to have muscle fatigue, so won't be risked for this game. So it'll be Florenzi at right back. Chow Tamari, the centre backs. Teo at left back. Same midfield three: Loftus Cheek, Krunic, Reinders from right to left. Same front three: Pulisic, Giroud, and Liao. And then the Barca team is funny. Like I, I mean. As I say, I think they're just a bit behind us in terms of where they're at for their pre-season. I don't know when their first game of the season is, actually. I'm just going to Google that, and that might give us an indication. Um, but I'm going to guess that it starts late. Oh, no, it does not. They play Getafe on the 13th of August. So the start yeah. of the La Liga si- season... 12 days. Will be 12 days away, yeah. Um, which is, and this which is their is only like... preseason game, right? Because they didn't get the, the previous one? Oh, they played... Real Madrid. Sorry, they played Real Madrid. And Apparently it's done. They played... Uh, Barcelona on the 27th played Arsenal, according to this, and lost 5-3. And then they beat Real Madrid 3-0 two days later. So I don't really know what's going on there. Dembele, Lopez and Ferran Torres scored hmm. there. So the 11 that they're supposed to be fielding for the game tonight or tomorrow, depending on if you're in Europe or not, because it's early hours again for us Europeans. In Archipania in goal, Dest at right back. This could be his last game before he gets his deal terminated. Yeah. Um, Jules Kunde and Eric at centre back. Eric? Who's Eric? I don't know who Eric is. <laughs> I'm have to Google that, man. It's just Eric. Eric <laughs> Garcia. Okay, yeah, yeah. Why oh. have they put Ga- uh, Eric and not just Garcia? Yeah, the guy they signed from Man City, he's actually okay. Uh, they wanted him for a long time before they eventually got him. Um, Marcos Alonso left back. Sergi, Roberto and Kessie as the two defensive mm-hmm. midfielders. Rafinha on the right wing. Fermin down the middle. Ansu Fati on the left wing. Ferran Torres up front. So Interesting. I don't know if that's going to be very close to what they consider to be their starting lineup for next season. But I'm looking at that defence and thinking, yeah, we Liao should have a go at Dest there. Yeah. That, should, that could be quite fun. That would be uh, so funny, actually. But then also, you know, you've got Ansu Fati up against Florenzi mm-hmm. and Chow. And, and I think Chow, in particular, struggled a bit with Chiesa. In that yeah, I, I, and Ansu Fati is really good. I don't know what their preseasons look like so far, but um, I know Dembele should be on his way out right now. So mm. I doubt he plays at all going to PSG. Um Liao against Dest is a funny one. And if that's the game that, that gets Dest contract terminated, that'd be quite the interesting foil that his last game is against the team he he kind of screwed his last chance with. I, I think um, I'd almost feel a bit bad if that happened. You know, I, I, I feel limited animosity. Like, he came in on a loan deal, obviously, and his intention was always to, like, play himself back into a USA starting spot ahead of the World Cup. He didn't really get the game time, I guess, that he wanted. But when he did play, he looked rubbish and rusty. And he made mistakes. 
But it's not like he's bad mouthed the club since he left us. If anything, he's been really complimentary and he thanked us um, for what he's been able to learn during the year. He did if have he some weird week- comments though um, about what he told Pulisic. He said, "I was honest about the club with my experience, and the only way I could be." Which to me says he said some bad things that were true to him, and that you know, fair enough. It's not like he had the greatest time here, but. Mm. Um, that to me says he probably said some bad things, but oh, his experience was bad. Let, let's let's be honest. Yeah. His experience was bad. Like by the end of the season, he was straight up excluded. Mm-hmm. Like he was not even part of the plans. And and there were games. No, there weren't. There weren't any games. I was going to say there were some games like when we were really thin on the ground depth wise, and we were making big rotations. Where I thought maybe you could throw him on off the bench and he might be able to bring something because he does dribble and he does try and drive play forward. It's just defensively mm-hmm. that he's so suspect. And but you know, like if, if purely he was here clear. this coming season with Christian or Chukweze on the right wing, he might have done better because there were opportunities for him to get forward last season and that he did well. He beat the first man and even the second man, but you know, mm-hmm. Macias, if that's your your outlet guy, it's what can you expect? So I don't know. He kind of he had a, ru- a rough run with us, but also he didn't help himself either, you know. No, you're right. He didn't help himself. Uh, it would be rather remarkable if, you know, you look at his last two clubs being being Barcelona and Milan, albeit with us on loan, and, and that's it. He ends up released. You know, he yeah. ends up without a club, and that looks like the way that it's going. When he was at Ajax, he was such a hot property, mm-hmm. and Barca really, really tried to get him, and this is the way that it could could end for him and probably go to wonder, um Watford and then Udinese follow the Dale Feu path. Yeah, yeah. It does make you wonder what's next for a player like him. Uh just in terms of players that might come off the bench for us to to kind of tie up on the on the Barcelona preview. By the way, this is a designated home game for us, which will be nice. We we get to see the team in red uh, rather than the away kit. Um obviously keepers nobody cares about but Batizaki could come on at centre back again. That was interesting. He literally looks like CDK with dyed black hair. Okay, so you saw in the chat when I said like, yeah, CDK and you thought black. that he was him. No one commented yeah. on it, and it wasn't until like maybe fifteen minutes after that that I was like, oh god, that wasn't even CDK. I don't know who I saw. Yeah. So yeah. that's now so the, the reason answer. you you were like monologuing yourself in the chat, and I was yeah, obviously watching was on a stream that was at least a minute behind. Mm. So I kept having to react to stuff on a delay, which is why I wasn't reading the messages. And I'm like, what is he on about CDK's dyed his hair? And then they showed a close-up of Batazaki, and I'm like, I see why he said that, to be honest. There's a little bit of a lookalike thing there. I thought it was um, him, 100%. But then, uh, also on the bench should be um, Romero and Shaka Traore. You know, those two we're excited about, I think, as teenage mm-hmm. wingers, ultimately. I, I think it's important they get some game time in, in a situation like this. And then you've got the likes of Adli Salamakas, Dike Talara. Maybe you could throw Colombo in there, but like we're getting into the territory of we don't know when it's going to be their last game. You know, the, the rumors are that there are several clubs interested in Dike Talara, the latest of whom are Marseille. Ajax have come in for Yassine Adli, which I'm always worried if a team like Ajax comes in for one of your young talents. That seems that, so, to suggest that they see something that we might not yeah. be seeing. Um, Salamakas. You know, as it stands, could I even be the fourth choice right winger at present behind Chukweze, Pulisic, and he seems to like using um, Luca Romero out on the right. But Salamakis has been filling in at right back. And then, yeah, we'll see about Colombo. A lot of it, loan interest in him and some links with us signing a, a young striker from from abroad to fill in that, perhaps that third choice role behind Okafor and Giroud. So, yeah. See what happens. As always, result not important. Will we overreact to what we see? Of course we will. That is imperative for internet discourse. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. And then and then the season draws ever closer, doesn't it? Talking points then. So, yeah, there we go. So, Eunice Moose is done. Woo. Happy with that? The, the, the total operation is probably exactly where we all predicted that it yeah. would have been. It sounded like Valencia were asking for 25. We were offering 18. We've met somewhere down the middle. That sweet spot for you again for us. And I think it's a signing with any signing 20 mil less for talent, mm-hmm. like genuine talent that other teams have been interested in is, is so low risk, potential high reward, in my opinion. And I think that this falls into that category. 
And although we heard from Filippo firsthand that he probably isn't ideally ready for an absolute starting spot in this team just yet, I think he might get that or he, he might rotate rotate in with um, Loftus Cheek. I I think that this is the kind of deal that we we've, we've been after for some time and mm-hmm. I trust the management. Yeah, I don't I mean obviously no games have been played yet so it's hard to say whether they've hit or missed on any of the, the transfers this summer but I'm cautiously optimistic on Musa as obviously as an American I'm excited for it and I want him to do well but also I don't want to see his career pass him by if he's right in the bench here you know just because he's one of my countrymen at my favorite club team I, I don't want him to be here just for the sake of being here I want him to be something you know I want him to be a good player and and I don't know if he's ready for that starting spot yet for him he's in a, a lucky position where we don't have Tonali um Pobega is not someone you want to have around Krunich might be on the way out supposedly Benacer's injured till February like he might really be either a starter or that first choice off the bench um, just by proxy of not having any other bodies on the, on the squad list. So in that aspect, I do think he's going to get game time. I think he'll play a decent amount, but is he ready for that jump? I'm not sure. We know that his time at Valencia wasn't exactly the greatest. Um, Watched him on the national team. He does fantastic. I've always thought he was fantastic there. And even, this summer at the Gold Cup, he played as a number six, and he looked great. It's not his typical role, but I thought he did really well there. I don't know if that's what we're going to try and do and force him into that role here. That scares me a bit because I think that might be the route we're headed here. And as as a young guy, you're either moldable or you need some time to adapt, you know. And I I, I just don't know where he's going to fall into at that. So it's scary. It's a risk. I do think there is a high reward on this, but I I also feel like this one could bite us if uh, the adjustment we want him to make isn't an instant click. You know, if it, if it takes time to adapt, remember, you got to look at those opening 10 games in the season. Mm. Roma mm-hmm. in week three, Inter week four, um, Juve and Napoli in weeks, I think, six or seven or seven or eight, one of those variations. But all the big teams in the opening 10 games and most of them back to back. So it's trial by fire for all the players, you know, mm. new or existing, they they're all getting it early, and that's scary. So you just gotta hope for the best, I guess. But I don't know. Overall, it's a it's a good signing. Like you said, it's it's not the highest fee in the world. It's a good spot for us. Very young guy, a lot of upside potential. I just don't know if it's gonna immediately click or if he needs more time. Yeah, yeah. All all points that I absolutely agree with. I went on Martino's podcast and basically said that there's two ways to to judge this this deal in particular the first is the the deal in isolation you know 20 million for for a talented young player 20 years of age a regular starter for his country can probably do better with better teammates surrounding him in a more ambitious team that has a better style of play uh all those things feed into it being a good a good operation when you judge it without any ex- external context but then when you when you feed it all into the position that we're in in the transfer window with a month left and with some perhaps more pressing and obvious needs, even in the midfield, it's not the signing that I would have made right now at this very moment. He's the signing that perhaps is someone that you can bring in as a bit of a luxury, maybe icing on the cake when we've made a couple of sales like CDK or an Adley. I just feel like we definitely needed a number six, a more natural number six. And they don't even have to be... Because there's two ways to play the number six role. Well, there's multiple ways, but there's two main ways to to play that base midfield role. Number one is to be the defensive anchor, to be the Kessie-type player who's going to cover a lot of ground, who's going to shield you back far physically, uh, and he's essentially going to sweep. And then the other way is to be like a deep-lying playmaker. So when you get the ball, you're the one who's responsible for starting build-up play. And, you know, you may be distributing wide or you may be giving it to your two midfield runners either side. And I think that either of those would be fine for us. You know, I think that the quality from our team comes further up the pitch. So you need someone to add a bit of balance in front of the defence. And I don't think that we've recruited that player yet. And it certainly isn't Radio Krunic, who we'll come to in a second. Um, so whether we're going to try and mould Musa into that player, whether we're just going to you know, in Shalai with, with Krunic, depending on what happens with his future. 
I don't know. And and coaching is a big part of it as well. Like how Pioli actually wants this midfield to operate. Does he even see it as a one two, or does he see it as a flat three? And they're going to press in pairs, and one has to drop back, and it, it might be a different player each time. Don't know. The the good thing is we don't get paid to make those decisions. We get paid to criticise those decisions, <laughs> which is a brilliant position to be in. <laughs> um, but we'll talk Krunic now. I mean, there are now reliable sources that are saying that, that Fenerbahce is strongly pressing for him and that they've agreed personal terms with him and the player's actually open to the move. I was surprised when I saw the sources from Turkey say it. But I thought, well, these are the same sources that fabricated a quote from our sporting director. So we'll take it with a pinch of salt. But then it's been confirmed by sources over here as well that, that Krunic would actually be open to the move. Interesting, because I wonder if the situation we're seeing play out is preceding something that we don't know. So as it stands on paper, Krunic is our starting midfielder, you know, in the, in the middle mm-hmm. of the three. And I don't see anything to suggest that that that's changing unless we make a signing explicitly for that role. I think Musa will come to be a box-to-box player at worst, playing a double pivot. Same with Reinders, same with Pobega, same with Loftus-Cheek. They're all box-to-box players. So does Krunic know that somebody else is coming in for that spot Mm. and therefore he could potentially be like fifth choice, potentially fourth choice? You know, I I don't know what's going to happen with the... um, I mean, he's he's always been... Well, I shouldn't say always, but last season he was first off the bench and towards the end of it, he was a starter in some games, depending on what what was needed. Mm. Uh, Looks like it's about to start storming here. Sorry. But um, it depends on if he wants to continue with that role, if he's okay with that in this point of his career, or if he thinks, no, I need to be starting and playing wherever I can. I don't know if Fenerbahce is in the Champions League, um, but we obviously are and we're a far more prestigious club. So if he has that ambition to, to just get trophies to his name, then he'll stay at Milan. Right. Um, if if he just wants playing time, which you have to respect that, if a player just wants to play at any point, you know, th- then I could see him going, especially if the money's right for him. I don't know what it is. I don't know the, the, the terms of that, but if he agreed to it, it probably is. Um, as far as someone coming in, that does scare me. Even if it's a great player, someone like, even if it's a world-class player, which it's probably not going to be because we know how we do business. We go for a specific range and the players that are world-class are above that. But um, if a player comes in, you're now looking at a midfield three of three players who weren't here last season. Mm. That is a very dangerous game to play, especially when you're going to have two players in the attacking trident that weren't here last season. You know, you're, you're getting to a point where you have too many new people in the beginning to start. Getting to 2017, 18 areas, aren't you? Yeah, you're you're losing that chemistry. I mean, we've seen it a few times where where Loftus Cheek is making an incredible run and makes a great smart pass, but the team doesn't understand that he's going to do that, mm. and it ends up in the other team having possession. You know, and, and that will work down the road, down the line. We might have a really strong end to the season, but as I've said, we play all the big teams early. We need a strong start to the season. That's where we build that gap in the Scudetto race. So. Bringing in someone new to start, you know, at this point, I, I, I don't want Kroonish to go. If it was it last season, I would have said, yeah, sure. You know, I, we had Tonali, we had Benacera, fine. This season, I think we need just that little bit of consistency that someone who knows Liao, who knows the back line, who knows Giroud, Tijani doesn't know them. Loftus Cheek doesn't know them. I think if Benacer were fully fit as well, the conversation changes because totally he different. could be the glue that would hold things together. But he's not going to be available for us regularly until probably February. So now, yeah, you you are looking at him being the one constant because Pobega is not and is not going to be starting level for for some time. He well, might not even the hang one around. Constant yet. Piece of shit. Yeah, <laughs> the Kevin constant. <laughs> uh, God bless him. Uh, we were reminiscing the other day in the chat about yes. banter era moments. And and we're gonna do something on that, probably a Substack episode on our favorite banter era moments because we were just spitballing them for some time, man. And I was howling with laughter at how bad some of them were. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens with with Greenwich's future. I think the midfield is the thing that has probably attracted the most debate and discussion among fans. Despite, I mean, it's undergone massive upheaval. You know, club record sale followed by two soon to be three signings, and yet people still really worried about 
where we're at with it. I think that speaks volumes. So we'll wait and see. Maybe more indications come from the Barca game tonight. Maybe Krunic starts pushing for the exit. And if it's him that's that's saying, I feel like I've given everything I can to this and I want to start games and try a new project, then I, I also wouldn't stand in his way. You know, he's been loyal to us. Mm-hmm. I think he, he, he would be afforded that. What if, um, and, and here's a, a rumor I'm pulling out of thin air completely. Krunic leaves and we take this opportunity to get Kessie back from Barca tonight. I was going to say, actually, as part of the Barca preview, do you think there'll be some talks between Kessie and the team or not? I, you know, like how, I how, so. how, I, how, I, how badly was it taken that he promised to renew and then left? You know, I think it was taken pretty badly. However, I think last season we saw how important he was. And like if he said, I made a mistake, I want to come back, I don't think anyone would hold it against him. The, I know for. There's, there's two clubs that you really can't hold a player at ransom for wanting to go to, and those are Real Madrid and Barcelona. You know, those are the, the two iconic teams in, in the Messi Ronaldo era of, of gaming. So if a player says, I want to go to Barca, I want to go to Madrid. Maybe Man City of how, now. Yeah, Man City now, but. Yeah, not. You know, I, I just think those are the two clubs that historically you're just like, okay, if you want to go, you're going to go if they want you. Um, but maybe if he wants to come back, you know, door's always open. Fabrizio did say that he, if he is going to leave Barca, and it sounds like he's actually going to hang around because he had a pretty good end to last season. He also yeah. scored in El Clasico, which was mad. But uh, said that um, he, he would try an experience in the Premier League if he wants to leave. And maybe yeah. he considers, because Juve have been after him and it sounds like there hasn't been much opening on that front. And Juve could really use him as well as us. Uh, but yeah, I would also understand if he considered his time in Italy done for for a while, and then see what happens down the road. But yeah, be interesting. I mean, there's another scenario in all this. Like Fenerbahce wanted Nicolas Dominguez from Bologna, so maybe they sign Krunic instead, and then that frees us up to go for him or another profile like 3D chess kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Maybe you make that sacrifice, and then you bring in the money. Because it'd probably be a capital gain. You know, we only pay like seven, eight mil for Krunic and we could potentially get 10, 15. You know, it's yeah. a few mil capital gain. Gives you a bit more breathing room to go out and spend on on a player. Maybe Musa's coming in now because we know Krunic is going and then we spend on the six. I don't know. Maybe we're about to see something really interesting play out in the next week or so. But God, this is exciting. You know, it's, it's been a while since we've seen such a fluid transfer window. There's even talk of nice. still signing another striker. Depending on what happens with Colombo, like if we decide to loan him out, we're going to invest in a young number nine. That's... And if we sell CDK, like the amount of money that we have to receive to sell him, I mean, that's more than we would have spent on a new player. So I guarantee we'd, we'd get someone in at that point, you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Let's do some questions then. Um, Christian Espinosa asks, what do you think about starting CDK as a striker? I think it's the only place where he has a chance to succeed for us because he isn't box to box and he's not a Traquartista. I think Pioli should start him there for the first few games and see what happens. Um, We've talked about this before, yeah. haven't we? And it is really one of those, we're now getting to the point where it's like, well, just try him there and see, but that can't happen. Like, you can't actually do yeah. that in competitive games and be like, I'm, I'm in two work. minds on it because. We're talking about a guy who is an attacking player that got zero goals and one assist an entire season with us. So now you want that guy to lead the front line? Like, is is that going to translate to more goals or is that going to translate to a striker that doesn't score for us? And and it's really a 50-50. You never know. I mean, if you're closer to the goal, then logic says you're going to be more shots on goal or whatever. But if you're missing every shot you're taking, then you're not going to make them no matter where you're at. So I, I don't know. It's... It's iffy. It's a tough one. I do think that is uh, – it changes the profile to someone, I guess, more mobile because CDK is creative and he he's a big body. He's just physically not that strong. Um, so I think he – there is potential there, and he did play as a center forward uh, from, from Bruges. But I don't know. I, I think his story might be over with us. Yeah. It, it feels like we've run out of – of things with CDK where we can say maybe this might work, mm-hmm. maybe this might unlock him. He's got to help himself a bit. Like second half of last season, the fight seemed to go from him a bit, and he really was playing like a, a, a scared, timid. And player. we did play him as a striker a few times. 
Yeah, he played uh, in, as part of a front two in like that cup game, and mm-hmm. there they, 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 they were always glimpses with him, you know. But that's all that they ever were. He never yeah. strung together two good games, unfortunately, and it just seemed to go down as the season went on. And I, I think more, more people would say Pioli has totally lost it if he started CDK as a centre forward for any of the early games next season than would say this is the right move. I, I, I think we're at a position now where he isn't part of the plans, be that good or bad. And I think we also need to be realistic and say we're going to really struggle to get our money back on him or even avoid a capital loss. Um, so, you know, maybe 20, 25 mil gives yeah. us a bit of liquidity that we can put towards players that are deemed more useful. Raja, this is a really good question. I like this one. Uh, he asks, would you rather have the market that Milan have had, multiple young potential superstars at a low cost or the market that Inter have had a few established but expansive players I don't know about you but Samadzic Turam Fratesi potentially Skamaka alongside their already established stars scares me uh no I, I pick our window 10 times out of 10 I mean it, you mentioned those things but what is Samar's last name was Lazar Lazar he hasn't signed yet and Skamaka hasn't signed yet. We know they don't have the money for their main two striker targets, according to Fabrizio Romano and Battle Gun and Jonathan David. They signed Taram on a free. Um, who they was got humiliated there. in the Lukaku thing as well. Humiliated. Um, they so they they got their fourth fourth choice striker, going for another one who might be better, might not be. Um, they lost their goalkeeper, both goalkeepers, and Handanovic is a free agent now, and Onana to to United. So they don't have any goalkeeper at all right now. In fact, for their preseason tour, they brought three youth players, and that's it. Um, and Fratesi, Fratesi was an overpriced bum. Like when we got linked to him, I wept. You know, I, I was crying tears, and then I cried more tears when he signed for Inter. Tears of joy because that's not a player I want on my team. He's not good enough, and. I don't know, spending that type of money to, to get a player who was at his peak at Sesuolo, he's not going to be better than Sesuolo caliber. Um, that's that's such a win for, for us to not have to deal with that shit. So I think Inter have had an abysmal market, and I think they've objectively gotten weaker. And, yeah, at this point, like, nah, I'm not worried about that. They, they might still beat us for whatever reason. We can't fucking beat them anymore, but I, I don't think they're a better team than us, and I don't think they've had a better market. Yeah, we, we know what's happened in 2023 against them. I, they, they've had our number. And I think that those games in particular have kind of shaped the way that we've operated in the transfer window too. They totally outmatched us physically in those two Champions League games, uh, which was picked out at the time by Maldini. I thought his comments on that were, were pretty honest. And I think that we've moved to address that now by switching to a more balanced, but also a more aggressive, more physical, like bigger, physically bigger team. Um, and that that's mostly still there. But if you look at the players that have left them this summer, um, and there, there are quite a few of them, you know, that you would say were, were key players. As you've mentioned there, Andre Anana's gone. They, they did okay on that because they got money and they'd signed him on a free transfer. But Edin Dzeko was really important for them. He, yeah, he's getting on a bit age-wise, but he's still good at what he's good at. And he caused he us all kinds of problems. He was starting in the Champions League final. Exactly, yeah. Uh, he caused us all kinds of problems, caused a lot of teams' problems. Um, Marcelo Brozovic has gone. He was the balancer in their midfield. It's funny, we're talking about us not playing with a defensive midfielder. Like, Inzaghi was playing Chalonoglu there. That is not going to not gonna work forever, I, I don't think. you know. Um, so they've lost Brozovic, who... Is an incredibly talented player. I've always been a massive admirer of his, and I'm I'm glad that he's gone. To be honest, um, galliardini has gone. You know, not much to say about that. Milan Skriniar has left as well. So looking at him going into next season with Bastoni, don't get me wrong, he's great. They've spent money to buy a Chirpy permanently from Lazio. He's now mid thirties. He'll probably be in the middle. Can he have the same season as last season? I really don't think so. I think we're looking at a key air style drop-off with him, you know, be it physically or be it in his form. And then it's probably going to be Damian as the right centre-back because they've chosen not to spend on a on a replacement um, for, for that particular position. Um, and then 
yeah, the, I, I just think that they've lost key pieces and the, the players that they've gone out and got to to um, to replace them. Quadrado on a free drew protests from their fans. They really didn't want him, you know, but they've gone out and done it. They've spent seven million on a centre back from Germany. Uh, well, a German centre back, sorry, from a team called Aarhus in Denmark, uh, called Bissek. I don't think he's going to be an immediate starter. He's a talent, but when Inter are a team that have massive financial and liquidity problems, to invest in a player that's not ready yet. Uh, Turam comes on a free, but for high wages. As mentioned, they paid that fee for a Cherby. Um, the fee for Fratesi, I suppose, is delayed to next year, but it's still a six mil loan, and then the obligation to buy that comes next year. And I don't think that he is he's, he's going to replace Mkhitaryan, you know, rather than getting that player that they needed to be in the middle of the three and keep everything in order. I think they've they've actually probably uh, bought a player to replace a player that maybe had another season or two in him. So that was a bit strange. Maybe they're looking at us thinking the same with the signings we're making for the midfield. But yeah, I, I am I'm always worried about them until we start beating them consistently. It, at the moment it's been Win one win a season here and there, and I, I think we owe them one after what what happened last season, particularly this year with the four defeats in a row. And we we need to get back to being absolute top dogs. Um, but I am not as gassed about their market as some other people are. We'll wait and see. Yeah. I, I think Inzaghi's always capable. Of and work. you know how I know, and I honestly don't even enjoy talking about their their window because the point I'm about to bring up, but. How, the reason I know that they're worried about our signings is it's all I see them talking about is mm. how bad our signings are. And if our signings were truly that bad, they wouldn't care at all. It'd be like us where no one's – you don't see any Milan fans mentioning Inter. But the, every day they're making fun of what we've done. And it's like, okay, you're obviously taking note of it. You're obviously a little worried or else you wouldn't be doing this. So my bookmarks, they're full on on X as oh, it's cool. now called, you know. Yeah. But you know. on X. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so – Milan for Life 3 asks, do you think we will get a B team in Serie C next year, considering we are doing better financially? I no. want to get excited about players in the Primavera, but right now there is no clear path to the first team. Uh, I don't see it happening. Not not next season. Hmm. Maybe down the road. I know that they, there's been discussion of it, but mm-hmm. I don't I don't see it happening immediately. That's a, a big transition to make on August 1st. You know, it's it's just it's too late for that. So maybe yeah. Maybe the following year, as in 24-25 season, but not not this one. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was ever part of the plans for it to be... Because obviously there were meetings that took place at the um, Lega Serie A headquarters and stuff about bringing more B teams and development teams into the professional senior setup. And it sounds like the league are willing to facilitate that happening. Like as soon as teams apply that have got good enough academies, they will grant them access to Serie C immediately. And I do think that it's something that we absolutely should do. I think Juve is still a step ahead of everybody else because of their next gen program. But I think it was going to be too big a change to implement immediately, you know, mm. over the summer. It's probably always been something for 24, 25. Um, but I agree about the, the lack of a clear pathway. Yeah, in pre season, we've seen Columbus have starts, we've seen Simic play, Batazagi has come on, uh, we've seen Shaka Traore and stuff. That's pre-season. It's going to be different when when the senior season comes around, obviously. But I do think we are more willing to loan players out and and test what they're made of in in the second and third tier, which is important for their development. I don't know. It's tough because our academy has lagged behind for some time now in terms of producing first-team level players. I don't think it was ever going to produce five or six in one batch. Um, So we're going to have to be patient with it still. Abate is doing a good job. We're much younger comparatively than other Primavera teams by like two or three years average age. So there's patience needed in that sense too. But we have got some players to be excited about. We just need to keep hold of them now. Like mm-hmm. Zaroli's had interest from, from Dortmund and I think Ajax. And, you know, that, that says that we're, we're doing something right on that front because they try to poach that level of player. Uh, so we'll wait and see. It's an exciting season coming up for them anyway. Um Michael Gambino asks, who is your ideal striker reinforcement that would be possible in this season, in this summer transfer window? I think I might catch some heat for this, but I, I do think it's still possible. So I'm going to go for it. I'm going to say Bal again. Still, uh, yeah. I, I think it could still happen. The way we've been spending and, and now with the rumors of CDK leaving, 
Um, look, if he leaves, then then that's you know half the transfer fee right there. And I feel like striker is a position they want to address. Still, I know I've seen rumors um, or reports saying striker isn't a priority this window, but what was the first signing we tried to make? Taram. So it, it clearly is mm-hmm. important to us. And we signed Okafor completely silent. You know, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're still going for it, especially knowing that Inter have him as their primary target and they can't afford him and them stealing Taram from us. I wouldn't be surprised if if it does happen just to say, like, look, we got one over you or or even Lukaku. I know that's probably unlikely and he might be going to Juve now in, in a Vlahovic swap, which is an interesting Strange. idea. Yeah, but um, I, I think he's possible as well at this point. I think Lukaku needs a new club and it, look, he's he's shown he's willing to go to Juve. So why wouldn't he be willing to go to Milan? You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I I. I'm going to make some assumptions with this that I don't think that we are in the market currently for an, a starting striker. Uh, I, I don't, If you do some adding up, the, we, we got 70 million guaranteed for Tonali. For the first six signings of the summer, they totaled up to 69 million in fixed fees. So that covered that. And then we had 35, 40 million made available anyway as foreseen net spend. So that's probably gone on Shukweze and Musa as the last two signings. So now we're kind of looking at sales to fund the rest of the window. Unless we manage to actually get 30 mil for CDK and we offer it to Arsenal for Balogun and and we, we decide that that's the investment to make rather than spread that money over the other positions that we need. I think we're looking more at potentially something like a loan opportunity later on that mm-hmm. might come around or a young striker with potential to, to come in and provide a bit of added cover. So going down that route and not, not trying to get too carried away with the with certain links, um, I'd like Beltran from River Plate. I, I don't know what his reported transfer fee is. but he's I, I would take the other guy over him, Veliz. Yeah, Veliz is a lot more raw. Obviously, he's three years younger, and his he's asking price is 15 mil. Now, he looks really good, but he's ultimately still 19, and there's going to be a period where he needs to adapt. And, you know, he, he did well at the Under-20 World Cup. He's got 11 in 22 for Rosario Central in the league. Uh, this season so far, which is impressive numbers for a teenager, definitely. Uh, I think Beltran's just a bit ahead in terms of experience at the moment. Like, Velis is the kind of signing that you would make and then loan out, you know, rather yeah. than think this guy is immediately going to contribute in Italy. So I don't, I don't mind either of them coming in. I would still like the extra cover in that role because I'm not necessarily sure that Okafor is going to be played 100% as a striker. I think he'd be more like the Rebic replacement. Um so, yeah, I don't know. One of those two would be fine with me, to be honest. No, they don't massively inspire me. I see stuff like potentially into getting Skamaka for 15, 20 mil. And I just wonder if we could just try and beat them to that because that's that's a pretty bargain price, to be honest, given he went for 42 mil a year ago. And I would still take a bet on that. And he's Italian, homegrown. And he's a profile more similar to Giroud. So there's a bit of comfort blanket stuff. But, yeah. This is a tough one, is that? It is a tough issue. Um, part of the Swedish Rossoneri podcast asks, do you think PSG will go for Liao if they sell Mbappe? Um, well, it sounds like they're getting Usman Dembele right now. Mm. Uh, I don't think I don't think Liao would go. Not this late in the window. Um, even if they activate the release clause, I think he still turns it down. Um, and maybe with an eye for the following season sort of deal. Um but yeah, I, I mean, look, he had an interview today where he said Milan's a club where I could win the Champions League and win the Ballon d'Or. I don't think he's going to go to a club like PSG just because of money. He he made it very clear in his interview that he's here because he wants to be here. He feels like a leader. Um, yeah, he's he's really becoming, not to sound corny, but his own man here. And, you know, he's not that that talented, lazy teenager when that he was when he arrived. You know, he's... He's really becoming a leader in the squad, and I don't see him leaving that to be, you know, a rotational with Neymar. I, I just don't see him doing that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I'm nothing, nothing extra to add. Um, 
MJ asks, out of the remaining squad, who would you let go and how would you reinvest the money? Let, focus more on that. Who who would you let go of? Obviously, Rebic has gone to Besiktas. Uh, I suppose a slight footnote on that. Um, sad the way that that ended. That's what I'll say. You know, It's a shame that after the first two seasons with Rebic, we really thought we had someone you know, prolific and, and he became a bit of a cult hero. But then the last two seasons have just not gone to plan to the extent that we've let him go for like 500k fixed fee. So thank you for the for the memories made, but um, it was time to go. Yeah. And then Origi will also go. We know that Balotore is going to go. The players that have been left out of the squad for the USA, who else would you consider selling? CDK, um, Macias. I'd even allow Salamakers to go if if an offer like around 18 to 20 came in, which mm. I don't think it will. Um, but I, he's young enough that he still has a high potential. And there is a player in there. We've seen it. You know, he just went through a bad spell. But uh, Chukweze is going to be starting there. Uh, Pulisic is going to be starting over him. And it seems like even Luca Romero, based on this preseason, he's, he's had a hot preseason. So that makes him fourth choice. And I just don't see a world where he accepts being fourth choice, not at 23 or 24 years old. You know, not at that point in his career. He's He does have trophies under his belt. He does have a decent highlight reel. Um, a club would pay for him. And so if an offer came in, like I said, 15 to 20, I take it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to be edgy and to be a bit different, I'll be brutal and say um, Florenzi should go. He should have gone. Like, we can all be honest with ourselves and say we don't expect much from him next season. I don't think his body's holding up that well anymore. Um, I think Kalulu should be the deputy right back, to be honest. Uh, and we should sign another centre back. So Florenzi could go for me. Um, I know there's the squad list thing, but if we're just judging it on you know how we see it and, and presume that replacements would arrive, uh, Pobega should go. You know, we, we have a real chance there to sell a player who isn't and will probably never be good enough for us from a technical point of view. We sell him for a pure capital gain, and that gives us a lot of manoeuvrability to go out and get a more functional player. We're looking at the moment at him being a fifth-choice midfielder, and there's no rumours of, of him leaving. Um, Salamakas and Messias should go for all the reasons you said that basically fourth and fifth charge right wingers now um, and I think Salamakas has a bit of resale value so so he could bring in some funds definitely and then I would, I'd still keep Adley which I know sounds mental but if we're going to proceed with the box to box players I feel much better with Adley as a fifth charge midfielder than Pobega because I think he's at least got a bit of technical ability about him and he's definitely got the mentality too. Like he wants to try and succeed here. So uh, I, I wouldn't bin him off just yet. Uh, and CDK, I think, can go. But I don't think we get an offer that suits us. I think we end up agreeing a loan for him, to be honest, because we ain't going to hang around here and further deplete his value. Um, I know people will kick off and be like, what good is a loan for us when we've spent this much money on him? but you've got to look after your assets. And another season sat here on the bench for us is not going to do us any favours down the line. Um, so you maybe look at loading him out somewhere where he can express himself a bit better and then you can either reevaluate him or you can sell him for uh, for more money next summer. Uh, we'll wrap it up. I'm looking at the time. We've gone past an hour. Thank you to everybody who made it um, made it this far. I hope you're enjoying the pre-season coverage and whatnot. And... Um, and just a, a note to say that I might not be here next week. I'm going on holiday to Tenerife. So I don't know if the Wi-Fi is going to be good enough at the hotel. I'm hoping it is so I can hop on next Monday. Uh, and then, uh, what did I say? Oh, yeah, Chuck Wesley will be the bonus episode this week as well. So make sure to check out the Substack for that. Uh, and, yeah, follow us on, on X at Milan.com, follow us on all the social medias. Thanks to everyone who participated in our our giveaway for the Franco Baresi 1983-84 retro shirt. The winner of that will be announced very shortly. And uh, I've been your host, Ollie Fisher. Find me on X at Ollie Fisher. Yeah, I don't like saying that. So We're I'm just going to call it Twitter still. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm tweeting, I'm retweeting, all that stuff, yeah. Um, yep, thanks for listening. Dale. Goal! I got it there! Il gol di Teo Hernandez va un'area all'altra, è una meraviglia, senti il mio...